Hello and welcome to Pod Songs, where we interview inspirational people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today, my guest is Laura Weinbach of the band Foxtails Brigade, and her guest is Alyssa Bennett. You have really become like one of my heroes in the last few years and that I just so much to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. I mean, I I didn't know about you before the C word came out and I listened to the first episode. Well, the first episode I listened to, I believe, was Mary Shelley. And I was oh, like, oh, my God, they're covering like an author from long ago and on this current day podcast. And I just thought that in itself was really cool. And the way that you guys presented her and discussed like her life story and everything was just so compelling and really interesting in terms of the way that you guys sort of voiced it tonally. And I just loved it. I was like hooked from that from that point on. I was like, this is amazing. I can't wait to listen to more. And then like when you kept going with when I discovered, obviously, that you had covered a lot more contemporary figures or more current day people, it was just like. I just feel that the work that you're doing is really, really important. And like, for my people, life's like, work, I think it was, feels, it feels like my life's work. I think, you yeah, know, well, I mean, it's a great thing to have be your life's work. You know, I mean, people like me who don't necessarily know a lot about some of the figures that you're covering are being exposed to the realities that these women like endured and not just in an interesting, like fascinating way, but um, also being able to learn from, you know, the sort of trials that these people went through and how that has affected not just the course of their life, but like the course of our lives now. And I think it's like a mirror, a mirror for culture. It's interesting with the Mary Shelley episode because I think that she is a figure that after I researched her and we you know, wrote that episode and we recorded it. She's one of the, there are certain historical figures that we've covered that become, it, it's like a, the connective tissue of the, of the show that sort of threads through all of the contemporary episodes. And I, she's a person who, her and I think also Lizzie Siddle are these t- two women that come up a lot because there is this sort of um, footprint for how not only how we publicly and culturally malign women, but how women get into a position where they're going to be sort of um, analyzed publicly or socially. And she has a lot of those, those qualities. The missing mom, I think is a big quality. Yeah, totally. It's so interesting to see all the parallels that run through each of these stories and that, you know, and having them happen at all these different times, it's really interesting to see the repeating repeating patterns and that you're like doing the work to extract these amazing facts and like patterns I mean I'm so curious to know like how I mean this is just a side question really I have like a bunch of questions outlined I I don't know if we'll get to all of them but like how much time do you spend on each episode or on each person honestly a lot um you know I think I'm I'm a writer but obviously but I think um, what I really love is the research element. So that's where I kind of primarily find my pleasure. Um, and so the researching of those episodes, I don't know, there, there are probably episodes that are cumulatively with the writing and the research, 100 hours of work. Like I think Marie Antoinette, certainly 100 hours of work. You, you know, I'll read everything I can find. I'll watch everything I can find. And then with the more contemporary figures, um, one of one of the things that I really love is understanding how you know like I like message boards and I like YouTube comment sections and I like fan pages so to sort of sift through what people have said um over years and years and years is is a thrill it's I find it thrilling so the the bulk of the time is in the research but it doesn't that part doesn't feel like work it's like I I think I became a writer because I had to have a a repository for all this information or you just are carrying it around you know like I think I've I've said probably many times in interviews but it's I, I always think if you say something more than once you really mean it and they really mean it um for me I kind of want to be an archive you know I think that that my work and um 
the thing that I find the most gratifying is the concept that I can be the sort of um, compendium of information about women who are mostly I'm attracted to these forgotten figures, but certainly also the famous ones. And I like the the more obscure turns in their stories that are kind of only recorded in these either, you know, old books or trashy books or fan written biographies or in these funny corners of the internet. There's there's no other record for them. And I, I kind of I want to be the record. Well, you're not just the record. I mean, yes, you're the record, which is an amazing thing to be, but also you're giving us like a perspective that we might not have had on these different people. And um, that, in my opinion, is extremely important to have your perspective, like the kind of the actually specific perspective that you are contributing to the stories that you're telling. Oh. It's so nice to hear. Thank you so much, Laura. It means a lot. Oh my God, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Seriously, thank you for like just exposing me to all these realities that are going on and have gone on. Um, so, wait, Jack, did you want to ask any other questions? Because I have like a whole. Preface no, no, you go ahead. Go show. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm not used to doing interview. Like to interview. Oh, you're gonna be right. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. Um. Okay, so just to give listeners a little bit of context, um, you are the co-host of The C Word, a podcast um, with Lena Dunham, where you guys um, do sort of deep dive um, research into different um, notable women. women. Yeah, yeah, publicly, yeah, uh, publicly noted women um, who were very distinguished at one point. And then at some point had a sort of um, intense fall from grace where culture deemed them crazy or just um, mad or sad, as you guys say, <laughs> your guys' tagline. Um, and in, your ep- in one of the episodes that you had done, you had mentioned that um, some a listener had requested that you do an episode on Amber Heard, to which you had res- responded that there was no way you would go near it because it was way too new and fresh and way too toxic to go near at the moment. Um, And I also want to preface the question by saying, like, as I said before, what you're doing, I think, is really important to for people to kind of get a perspective, a different perspective than the way that most of the media is sort of painting these figures who are balling from grace and giving us a sort of insight into how they got to this point and enabling us to have compassion and empathy for people who might we might not have even taken the time to have. And that's why I think this is such an important thing. It really is like an exercise in compassion, what you're doing. It's like a demonstration of the act of compassion, really, and empathy. And that is something that I feel like the world really needs to have. So with all that said, why, like, well, I guess it seemed obvious to you and Lena why you wouldn't go near it now, but to me, I found myself thinking about that after the episode and wondering, well, what, what is it, it, how much time needs to have passed from a topic or subject in order for you to feel comfortable going near it? And why not touch something like the Amber Heard situation that perhaps maybe you could shed a light on to people now that maybe a difference could be made in the process of their sort of experience of public Annihilation, so to speak. Public annihilation, so true. I mean, I think um, the interesting thing about Amber Heard is that she's sort of this placeholder figure. So there will be another person that that assumes that position culturally. So I think you know, I think it came up in the Lindsay Lohan episode where I said something about her, um, like first the the appeal. The, the appeal of Lindsay Lohan to the public is the surface. And there's a lot of envy and there was a lot of desire and it's all external, right? And I think the same sort of thing happened with Amber Heard. Very beautiful, talented, has these things that I think we often don't think women deserve to have. And after a certain point, I think that the, there is some kind of charge that happens with public attention um, especially when there is kind of a public misstep where we then turn these women into containers and the the container is a garbage can. So it becomes the sort of place where we 
deposit our ire, where people can sort of deposit their misogyny. And this was the the thing about the Amber Heard story that really um, enraged me is that she became, or she is, she's become this figure where people feel legitimized in expressing how much they hate women deeply inside. She becomes the place where, where, you know, culture can point to her and say witch or gold digger or thief or liar, which are, you know, I think these, these terms are all, um, they're so bound in our interpretations of women. And I think, you know, the thing about that story and when we, when we recorded the episode that we talked about her in, it felt like, um, the dis- the public discourse was so charged. And I personally had a number of encounters with people that I respect and who I'm close to who had opinions about that trial that I, I found so fa- personally offensive. Like it made me think like, you're my friend, but you hate women. And I, I think, you know, to, to cover the case now, I also think that she's probably traumatized. The trauma is very fresh. I think um, generally in my work, when I look at something, it's kind of after, I like sort of shop-worn stories. So I like the story after everybody else is done with it. And I think that that's when you can kind of go in and almost do like a, like a pathological study, right? It's like the autopsy of the life. And I think that that story is still too active. It's too charged. There's too much static around it for me. Um, But I think the point when I become interested in it is just to circle back to the beginning of of the statement is when, when she's replaced, when the next Amber Heard figure takes her spot and everyone has forgotten about her. And I think that that's the time when people's emotions have cooled off or people have some critical distance when you can really make a case for how culture has has turned someone into a sacrifice i think she's a sacrificial figure as are a lot of the women who you guys talk about in the seaboard and um also that term like trash can container i feel like has been applied to other women that you guys have talked about in the seaboard which is i totally agree with um it, but I'm wondering. Oh, sorry. Go on. Oh, well, yeah. Well, no, you got. <laughs> I think really interesting in terms of you know we don't always cover celebrities. We don't always cover actresses. But when we do cover actresses, I think the thing that I always really think about and notice is what is our relationship to the screen? Like, what is our relationship to the person who's only projected across a surface? And what is it about you know? mass psychology that makes us think that having access to the projected image gives us any kind of insight into the person. And it's this this kind of really ravenous kind of ownership that happens via vision. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it. I think that one, because the drive is always to penetrate the screen, right? Like to go into Marilyn Monroe's house, to read the autopsy, to look at the dead pictures of Anna Nicole Smith's body to you know, really violate these women um, in a way that is about rupture and about penetration. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's, it, it happens over and over again that once we penetrate, the thing that's inside is the viscera, right? Like we want to get to the viscera, which is ugly and brutal and leaking and, um, you know, sort of diseased. And then that's what we make these people into. We transpose the outside with the inside once we've exhausted the fascination of the the flat image. Mm-hmm. And why do you think that, do you think that there will ever be a point where there won't be another Amber Heard, where there won't be another like public female figure that we don't kind of turn into a receptacle for our... Never, never, ever, ever, ever. I think, you know, a lot of, I guess a lot of the the way... A big part of the way that I frame the way that I look at these stories um, is dependent on sort of the entertainment industrial complex. And what does it mean? Um, You know, how has Hollywood shifted our psychology and how has like the camera shifted our psychology when the image can be sort of um, mass disseminated? And it's like a like an icon, right? Like it's the sort of religious fervor. 
So I think that it's certainly ramped up within the past 100 years, but this is always, you know, if you think about the figure of the witch, there's all women for whatever reason, culturally are the sacrificial figures and they're always the containers for this series of, of kind of broader cultural concerns. It, it's just, um, I, I don't, I don't see how it could, act. there would have to be so many major shifts within culture for it to change. And I think that Amber Heard is really proof of this because we would think that at this point, post me too, you know, like we're trying to be more critical about the way that we interact with celebrity. Um, and, and it happened again in such a major, major way, which kind of for me serves as proof that this is, it, I, I don't think it will ever end. Mm -hmm. Dang, bummer. <laughs> I mean, we have work to do. I, I think um, unless there's like a complete, I mean, maybe eventually there's like a complete collapse in the way that we interpret gender and um, masculine versus feminine and male versus female, but we're, we're not there yet. I don't, I don't see it happening right. on time. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Totally. It's just, I guess. The question is, like, how, if that will never change, then sort of, it's not, what's the point of this? Because it's also just insight into the human psyche, which is always worthwhile, obviously. Um, but I don't know. I think you answered the question, and I'll just leave it at that. And I think it's just something to contemplate and think about. Um, I mean, I think part of what we have tried to do with the show yes. and what I've tried to do with my, my personal work um, is to at least make a kind of legend for, or a roadmap for how these situations happen yeah. and like, how can we become more aware of them? That's, that's, I think the, the best case scenario in 2022 is how do we make people more aware of how um, there are these sort of, invisible systems in place that that write the same story over and over and over again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Arch archetype stuff which is so rooted i think just in like you know semiotics or philosophies of language or how meaning is generated um we always have to keep these um archetype positions filled but it's shifting yeah i think that i mean just to throw in my own two cents from what I gather, like from this sort of thing, like the kind of information that you're putting out there and the awareness that you're bringing and like the awareness that the Me Too movement has brought and other things like that, it might not be like, I mean, from what I think, I don't think there's going to be a shift that's going to be clearly visible and like having flipped the, right. turn the tables 180 right. degrees right away but i do think that is com contributing to a transition that we're like and we're we're going through i feel like human beings are kind of engaged in a transition and it's going to take a really long time to actually look back and go oh that was then and now we're at this point that's clearly you know somehow an evolution from where we were but and whether it's for better or worse but i do feel like i do feel like there is a shift happening and it's just going to take time. And whenever anything goes through a transition, it's like really awkward. And there's always points where we step backwards, where, you know, like it doesn't seem clearly like a forward progress. But um, but I don't know. Yeah, I just think being aware of stuff as much as one can be is always going to help growth happen. But I think that being aware doesn't ameliorate the violence of our interests. And I think it's something, you know, that I think about a lot um, because even as, as we're criticizing the, the structures that um, kind of allow us to pry into someone's private life or make assumptions about them based on things that may or may not be true, I'm a huge consumer of that kind of information. You know, right. so I think that that's part of the machine. That's like the oil in the machine is that we all like when you listen to to the C word, I think you listen to it because there is some part of you that that's fascinated by gossip and by, you know, just like the the volume of gossip that can be generated about a person if it's true or not. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that that's, it's a very human condition. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I hope you're right. I think unfortunately now, and for the past many hundreds of years, um, women have, have been the primary victims of that machine. Well, maybe Which, the one thing that will change is who will be the primary victim. Maybe, maybe yeah. That's, like maybe we can't change the sort of carnal instincts that we have to kind of oh, want to look at the majority of the dark truths of things, but but maybe we can change like the outcome of that. Maybe I don't know. I'm just trying to be optimistic here, but I guess it doesn't really matter what. <laughs> real to me. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um. But uh. But that is so true. Like, I mean, obviously there is this just addictive quality that we have to, well, at least I do, to, you know, dark subject matter and just the more gruesome, the better, I guess, in a way, in terms of like the the visceral experience of it and like the kind of almost entertainment value of it. Do, um, you, do you feel like um, you're a secretive person or were you ever a secretive person? Not particularly. I mean, I guess we all have some secrets, but not like compared to other people, I would say. You know, yeah. I think there's people who I would definitely categorize as particularly secretive, whereas I feel like I've been a little more open. But why? What are you getting at? <laughs> because I think sometimes for me personally, and I think sometimes for others, you know, when when I write about a person, if it's a man or a woman, um, I write about them I, I can only write about them convincingly. I can only write a convincing episode of The C Word if there is some part of the story that I relate to very deeply. And I think often the parts that we relate to and the reason why we're drawn to certain figures is because there's some kind of reflective quality in their story. And often the parts that I relate to are the parts of myself that I don't necessarily want to acknowledge. So when I started, when I started my zine, um, which is all, you know, kind of in, they're about me. Every, every person I write about is also, it incorporates like something that I never wanted anyone to know about myself, just kind of aired publicly. And I think that often the attraction to, to lurid stories, or like you said, dark stories is because there's some kind of um, thread of connection between you and this remote figure um, mm -hmm. that makes you feel some sort of um like psychological compatibility or something like that that's interesting i've heard it said I've, have you heard this theory i don't know if it's real or not but um that i guess in psychology they say that there are two types of people <laughs> in what in uh where yeah the one one type of person is really attracted to horror films or enjoys watching horror films and the other does not and they say that like those who do enjoy watching horror movies um, are so, more compatible yeah. with other people who like watching horror movies. And if they and if the two people and if there's like two people in a romantic relationship and they both disagree on horror films and their relationship is not going to last. Oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I find that I always think about that, too, like in my own relationships and and wonder. It's I wonder if it is. I wonder, I guess there's probably two different reasons to to be attracted to horror movies and it's either you relate to the victim or you relate to the aggressor do, we, do either of you watch do either of you enjoy horror movies i always have yeah i mean I, that was like my first exposure to you know i was like a very unsupervised kid so i remember i was born in the 70s so i remember going to the, the video store and nobody ever looked at what I wanted to check out. And I remember watching like really fucking gruesome, horrible horror movies when I was a really little kid. And, you know, I have an 11 year old who, you know, there was like a, a point over the summer where I was like, do you want to watch The Shining? Do you want to watch The Shining? And he was like, no, I'm too scared to watch The Shining. And I was like, fuck, I watched The Shining when I was like seven. That's just me really too. Inappropriate exposure. Yeah. Well, my dad, my dad is like a, a horror movie. I mean, he made like some cult scary movies <laughs> in the 70s. Cool. And so he would like, he always was watching, he was just watching movies a lot as a kid and he didn't care what we were seeing behind his back, like right. while he was watching. I just feel like we were exposed to some very weird stuff in terms of. Good for you. I think it's great. I kind of knew too. I mean, it definitely shaped who I am and I kind of don't regret that. But I also don't know if I would want my child to see like certain 
things now because I have a baby now that uh, oh. I have one. I have a seventeen-month-old, uh, oh. and he's like just really starting funny. to talk and like be aware of things. And uh. I feel like. I, we were watching a scary movie the other night and he was in the room and I was like, oh, great. I have to like close his eyes now. Actually, what? You know, the rule in my house is you can read any book you want. You can watch any movie you want within reason, um, but no video game. Mm-hmm. Do whatever you want. Don't ever ask me for a video game. <laughs> That's a pretty good rule. I feel like self self uh regulating i think like he knows when he's we watched misery last summer and he had to sleep with the lights on oh that's such a good movie i love that movie he knows if so, he thinks something's gonna scare him to to tell me no regardless your kid of- seems so interesting oh my god like he's a, a civil war expert and like he's 11 years old it's incredible. i think that i didn't even know what the civil war was at 11 <laughs> I mean, I just did not care about school at all. And history was one of my least inter- like interested subjects at that age. Yeah. Now I'm like more interested, but that's amazing. <laughs> and I saw your post that he got into a very good school. <laughs> yeah, he goes to like child genius school. That's amazing. Has You're- he like skipped grades? Well, he's in a le- he's in se- I almost said he's in 11th grade. He's in seventh grade. He's, he's in, in seventh grade at 11. Yeah, he skipped sixth grade. Then he's just—he's like a year younger than everybody. Wow, but that's cool. You have a little boy. Yeah, yes. It's like the only oh my God. good luck fairy you'll ever have. It's amazing. Um, it's it is really truly like just a joy. I did not expect to like being a mother this much, but I really do have so much fun with it. My, and, right now, my number one favorite thing to do as a mom is to just like choose the cutest clothes I can find and dress him up because I know I won't be able to oh, for very long. Doesn't last. <laughs> but he looks so good right now. I, I swear it's 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 awesome. We used to dress him like Steve Bader's from Pink or Pink Flamingos. He looks so good, like little leather jacket, striped That's shirt, awesome. done. Oh my god! Oh, that's amazing. Um, okay, I have another, I have a couple other questions for you. Um, do you guys have enough time for all, like, for me to keep yeah, I'm going? Good. I'm good. Okay, cool. Um, so, okay. One of the other things that I really thought a lot about, um, after the episode that you did on, um, Vampira, y'all, Molly and Nermi. Okay. Obviously you expressed throughout the episode how deeply felt connected you felt to this person's story and um how it really just like affected you emotionally. I and, could cry um, right now, Laura. I could cry right now, truly. I think that's so interesting because, well, I guess what I wanted to know. Sorry, I'm like looking at my notes because I like specifically wrote out what I wanted to know about it. Why? Okay, you said during the episode um how um how she basically obviously lost she she pretty much like died in destitute in total like obsolescence obscurity and not having at all been you know properly recognized or paid for her contributions to you know pop culture and like style and Obviously, her whole look and everything was very influential and, as you said, can be seen today in a lot of different ways. Um, and, um, sorry, I'm also like, I just, I feel like there was a specific way I wanted to ask you this question, so I'm just browsing my notes. Um, what exactly, like, why a Molly, it's Molly and Nermi, right? Sorry, not Myla and Nermi. It's Myla and Nermi. Yeah. Sorry, Myla. Okay. Um, like, what is it about her story that you feel so connected to? And how do you feel that this, like, oh, yeah, you said it's me. This is what I wanted to say. In the episode, you go, it's me. It's me. How is it you? You know, I think there's some quality to my person. I'm I'm kind of a loner. I'm not um, a hustler. I'm not terribly ambitious in some way. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not a hunter. I'm not a hunter but I do generate this very specific kind of of material as a writer and as a thinker and I really related to this idea that that 
you know, I felt um, that in the past, my intellectual generosity has has punished me. You know, like I, I share ideas, I give things away. Um, and I've often many, many times seen other people take ideas that I've generated and run with them. And, you know, when when I think about that story and when I was reading, learning about it, you know, reading about her, um, there was something about her, you know, there's this this image that I often have of myself that that I'm like a lemon tree, right? So it's like a lemon tree in a, a town square and people come by and they pick the lemon. They pick the lemons and they pick the lemons and they go and make whatever they make with it. And then, you know, it's it's like you're generating the fruit, but you're not appreciating the payoff. And there was something in her story that feels very, very familiar to me. Um, specifically, I think, you know, not to even compare what I do with what she did, because I think that she was really a revolutionary. And I think that she was a revolutionary thinker and a revolutionary athlete and all, you know, a really remarkable woman. But I think the fact that, you know, we live in a culture that will reap the benefits of her labor without feeling any kind of responsibility to to credit her with with what she actually was and you know i it, it's it's like a very deep fear you know also just to go back to this idea of obsolescence that i talked about earlier and that i talk about a lot i think i i am attracted to obsolescent or obsolete figures um or women that have sort of cycled through the digestive tract of, of fame or culture and then end up forgotten because that's that's my great anxiety. It's like, what do you have to do to not be forgotten? Um, and I think, you know, learning about Myla Nurmi made me think like, this is the worst possible scenario. Like the ending up where she ended up is the worst case scenario. And it it scared me and it made me feel, you know, I don't want to say pity for her, but um, like a deep personal sense of share of the loss. I just really, it's, it's the thing that I'm so afraid of, um, mm-hmm. get kind of used up culturally and then like your husk is discarded and blows away. Yeah. Yeah. To be forgotten also just that it's one of my biggest fears. I mean, as an artist, it's like, yeah, uh, it's think about it, like how can you be relevant and not be for, and like, I think that we're probably all looking for some element of like immortality through the work that we do. But I wanted to kind of ask you, like, that led me to the next question, which was, well, you talked it, so I did some research on some other interviews that you've done. And uh, I read the interview magazine one that you did, which I thought was really interesting. Um, Or sorry, not interview, um, it was, that's the one you did on- The Vincendo one. Yes, yes. Um, I'll talk, can you believe it? (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. That is that was such a cool interview. Oh my god, I loved it. But um, no, the one that you did for what was that magazine called? Um, S. Uh, shoot, S- I- huh? Yes. Okay. Or sense. Um, I- oh, sense. Yes, and you said at the end of it, like, you know, you mentioned just that you did did a lot of research into the kind of corrosive effects of fame, and I guess fame is equating to kind of recognition. And then I thought about how you really connected with the um, Myla Nurmi story. I keep wanting it's to say funny. Molly. You know, it's it's interesting for you to bring this up because I think like on the conscious level of my brain, I always think that um, my fascination with celebrity is more rooted in the fan aspect. Like I'm obsessed with fandom. I'm obsessed with what it means. I'm obsessed with that circuit. I'm obsessed when it like when it goes off the rails, over identification, um, and just this kind of idea that we're always looking for reflections of ourselves in public figures, which is how I think people get famous. You know, I think there are certain pe- people that come into public consciousness and there's something about them that either represent um like the idealized self, like if if only my life were slightly different, I would be this person or, you know, what we want. There's a lot of desire, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think, you know, with the, with the Milo Nurmi story, it, it, my interest is, isn't in people that worship her or the fact that her look is so replicated by people or that she's such a, you know, like a, a commonly counterfeited figure. It's more with the idea that she was this person that that people identified with later, but there was kind of nothing, nothing left for her. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. So, but knowing what you know about how recognition and fame is corrosive, um, there's still obviously like this desire to have recognition and to, I mean, I'm just curious, like what would be your ideal level of recognition or even fame it, would you want fame do you want that do you want everybody wants success but what does that mean to you I guess you know I would like to be able to have a life where I can make whatever work I want you know I, I still work at I have like a this day job that um at the gallery anyone I work with is going to listen to this so I'm just going to be totally honest I have a job where, you know, my colleagues are people that went to Ivy League universities to learn how to do this. And it's like I work at a gallery where people are like, that's my dream job. You have my dream job. And I've sort of failed up. Um, so I'm not necessarily that good at it, but I represent something significant enough that that I've managed to get to this point. But as people, you know, sort of want this job that I have my fantasy of what a good life looks like is that I don't have to serve anybody else right so I have this job where I'm working with artists and I'm helping them make shows or work on exhibitions or you know sell work and in in my big fantasy I just get to um you know do my research survive off of it I don't I you know I don't have any fantasies about wealth or anything like that it's more I think my fantasies are about freedom and being able to indulge in this very particular thing that I'm good at. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And not what but would part of that also be also being remembered like in the future. Wow. I think I think that every sure. artist or writer, musician, um you don't do it in a vacuum, right? So you do it because you want to imprint culture somehow. Mm -hmm. And do you think that inherently, like, by imprinting culture, that there is going to be a corrosive quality to that? No, I mean, I think about, I think, you know, think about someone like Joan Didion, who I think was not, I'm not that she was a reclusive person, but she wasn't, like, looking for the Klieg light. And that's mm -hmm. something that I really respect. Mm -hmm. uh, people that generate their work without looking for celebrity but there is this undeniable mark made on culture forever yeah even if, you know it's even if it's only for like a sort of specific subset of culture you know like I don't need to um write a marvel movie if I don't you know I don't right. need that yeah that kind I don't need to like go out and have people recognize me but um, yeah it is Sorry if I'm asking kind of a dumb question. I don't know. I guess I just no, wanted to. God, it's, it's interesting also because, you know, I grew up, when I grew up, I was going to hardcore shows and punk shows. And, um, you know, the 90s was obviously like the heyday of the fanzine. And I think the thing about the, the idea of the zine that's really interesting is that it was like a sort of cultural tentacle. So you reach out to like-minded people so it's like the smoke signal right and I think that, that that's more the model that I'm interested in is sending out this smoke signal to people like you where they're you know we sort of make this 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 circuit or this loop where it's like we recognize each other that's really yeah. important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um by the way your zine I really want to get it so oh, I want to get well, the z well, multiple zines I guess you put out but Dad is Better was the main one that I had kind of been able to. I just read like two pages of it because it was printed in an article about you. I think it was like the Vogue one. And we uh, will anthologize them eventually. They're very sold out, but oh. we will put them in a book eventually. It's, it's quite a bit of material. 
Um, oh my God, it looks so good. Like just those two pages I read, I was like, I want to read more. <laughs> Let's see. I need them to be, to be fun. It looked, it was so, I love how you wrote those in the second person, you know, just like there's so many things that that opens up in terms of how the reader experiences it. And it's always well, and that, and be. that led me to another question, which was this, have you ever, um, okay, this is kind of two questions in one. Have you ever been contacted by a person that you've covered on the C word? That's part one of the question. Part two is, and there's actually more of a part three after the second question, but do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> I've never been contacted by someone that we've covered, but I have been contacted by people. Do you do bleeping out on this show? Can you bleep something out? Well, yes. Okay. I've received a lot of very negative communications from. Really? Incredible. Oh my God. I would imagine that she would have been one of the people who people request to cover. She thinks that I'm a misogynist. It's funny. It's a funny situation because um, we have like a, a very significant number of shared friends and shared yeah. friends. I, like I'm really close with, you have to bleep this name out too. Who was like, she was his only girlfriend in like 1987 or something. He was like at the intervention. I'm friends with her teenage best friend. Um, but she, I think is, you know, I think that's an example of someone who's been so traumatized by, again, the violence of our interests that, that it feels it feels like rape to her. I think for someone to dig through the things that have been said about her and try to parse out what's truth and what's fiction, she is so her life has been so modeled and shaped by um, the intrusiveness of our gaze that I think she feels very very traumatized by it so I, I try not to to judge her for it but very anxious that we would do an episode on her very upset with the way that we've talked about people um, would you ever do an episode on her knowing now like never right. ever, ever and never, she never thinks that you, she's like paranoid that you would or well because she's like the natural subjects that people always bring up but you know I think as a uh, I think I'm a really sensitive person. I don't want to hurt anybody. You know, yeah, I'm like so shocked that she would think that you would be a misogynist or like that you would be coming from a, a you know, a place of like ill wishing or, you know, it's like an anxiety yeah. muckraking. And I think she's probably I'm sure that it's it's, you know, she's I'm sure we've covered people on the show that have the same set of anxieties. Um but right, I think, like I was going to say, like Lindsay Lohan had, I mean, she's obviously still alive. I mean, as are some of the other people you covered. I wonder what she would think, or like Jenna Jameson, of how you Jenna got. Jameson. I mean, she could be a similar person. But, you know, I think the thing with, with Jenna Jameson that was really interesting for me was um, to understand how her public image crystallized, regardless of the fact that she she'd been very clear, um, especially in that book that she wrote, um, How to Make Love Like a Porn Star, she'd been very clear and public about her injuries and nobody cared because it didn't suit the the surface of the image. Um, but, you know, I think it's certainly, even with Lena, I understand, um, and that's why it's been interesting to do the show with her, you know, something will come out about her in, you know, the Daily Mail or some, like, fucked up internet rumor or you know even like any of those long-standing falsehoods that have been sort of circulated about her um and i see very clearly how painful that is and how painful it must be for every woman that we've covered to have to confront um these rumors but i think you know for me the point of the show is that you confront the rumors and then you you disengage them you know you need yeah them. yeah that's what's so cool about your show <laughs> is that you're totally being giving people another way to perceive what these rumors have kind of depicted um and yes everyone. i do believe that goes 100 percent. okay because i was like well i was gonna say like with the with the molly and Ermi episode Mylon or me, sorry. No, oh, I felt like she was in my room. 
Like, did you have any kind of experiences where you got like signals that you were being? Yes. Yeah. Really? Um, you know, I'm writing a book that's about, uh, it's sort of like a, a chronological assessment of Hollywood from the 20s until now um, as read through items of celebrity memorabilia. And the first chapters, I wrote a chapter on Jean Horloy found this book that she, she wrote a novel when she was on suspension from MGM in 1929. And they found the, the manuscript in an auction and then um, through research understood that it had been published in this very limited run in the 60s. And I bought it and I was like, fuck, wow. So I'm, I'm writing about that. And I, I had this feeling, I was like, it felt like, like, it was something that was left in my path for me to find. And then um, I write about the production of The Misfits a lot, the Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable film. It's like one of my fucking great obsessions. I've written about it many times. And I was writing about um, this wig that Marilyn Monroe wore in The Misfits. And I, I have the psychic that I go to sometimes. And she, she was like, there's this guy in the room. He's dressed like a cowboy. And he's asking me why you haven't written about it. So it's just like describing in this. the room where you guys were doing your consultation. I was like, it's fucking Clark Gable. Like this is Clark Gable. Wait, in the and, room with you? Yeah, like in the room. And she's like, I hate to say this because it's that it was in Los Angeles. She's like, it always sounds so cheap because we're in Los Angeles and that's what everybody wants. <clears throat> and she said, and there's a blonde woman in here. There's a blonde woman, and she said she left something for you. She left something for you. Like, this is your responsibility. And I was like, oh my God, it's Jean Harlow in this book. And then she said to me, and I have another, I have this, um, this incredible astrologer, Sasha Ravitch, recommend her to everybody. She does this reading that's like the ghosts in your house. I think it's called the haunted house reading. And she said to me, she was like, you know, people or spirits are, they put these things in your path so that you'll find them. And she said, when I look at you in the room, it's like there's this, this gang of drowned women behind you. And she said, usually it would be really negative and frightening, but here it's not. And I was like, this is like what I'm on earth to do. It's to look at the drowned women and, mm -hmm. you know, redeem them. Wow. Hundred yeah, percent believe in them. Oh, um, yeah. Oh I don't God, write that anymore because I was told. You said what? Wait, say that last part again. I don't write in my bed anymore. Oh. I was told both by Sasha Ravage and by the psychic um, that there is, you know, I've been told that I'm like, if I wanted to be a psychic, I could. It's like the sort of intuition um, and this communication that I have. And she, they, they both told me that if you write in your room, they will come in your room and they won't leave. And that's, mm -hmm. that has to be private space. So that's like my new policy. I don't write in my room, but I do um, feel things. I do have, I don't know, like communication with people, a hundred, like a, a great, I, I think I, especially when I write about a deceased woman, um, I feel like a, a, a very heavy responsibility, like a very personal, heavy responsibility. It is one. I mean, you're putting this information out into the like stratosphere. I mean, and people are absorbing it and like really, really taking it in, you know, I mean. It is a responsibility, but also I feel like you're doing really good justice to that, you know. Oh, thank you. Seriously. I mean, not to just like keep showering you with compliments, but I really just love what you're doing. I think it's... Thank you so much. Okay. I feel like um, what I'm here for. Yeah. Okay. I just like a couple smaller questions. <laughs> One is, um, so you were teaching a class at Yale? I am. Yeah. Oh, you still are? Yeah. So are you a professor? <laughs> I'm, you know, it's funny. Um, when Yale, you know, they have to, you have to have like a, a biography and they ask you for your CV. And I was like, you know, one of my claims to fame is that A, I've never had a job interview ever. And B, I've never written a resume. I was like, I, I like, I, it's, it's the sort of, um, 
I don't want to call that failing up because I think I deserve it and I'm qualified. And yeah, those those kids are so lucky. They're going to have a great class. Um, <laughs> but it is, you know, I, I'm, I, I have a lot of luck somehow. That's just awesome. To get Maybe in the like that. Girls might be helping you. Yeah. I think so. I mean, not without a doubt, but also what, what is the class that you're, wait, sorry. I hate to do this, but I really need to go grab my computer charger because my computer is about oh, to die. I might Me no. two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> okay. I knew I forgot to do something before we started this. I was at 8% too. So it's the thing that you. I was at like, I was at nine when I realized the thing was going down, but I didn't want to interrupt. And then it was like at two and I'm like, okay. Yeah, emergency. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'm going to wait for Jack to get back before I ask you the next part. But again, uh, I'm like so stoked that you even agreed to do this interview. Oh, I really didn't fun. think it was No, I'm so glad to do it. Um, is the class that you're teaching, um, like how often is it once a week? Yeah, it's a once a week class and it's actually a, a photography class in the graduate department. Um, oh. But it's the, the title of the class is Images and Their Afterlives. So I'm taking it in a different direction. So, you know, Yale has um, this British art collection and they have a number of drawings by Lizzie Siddle, which is really, really exciting to me. So we'll do... One section on probably the pre-Raphaelite women and um, what it means to become, you know, this it's they're they're all interesting. Lizzie is the one that I'm I'm really obsessed with, but they're all interesting because they were primarily these working class women who were then, you know, scooped up by this group of young painters and mm -hmm mortalized so their their images are very recognizable like if you it when someone doesn't know who lizzie siddle is i say she's Oph the model for ophelia so like the famous one of my favorite paintings oh my god yeah. and then everyone's like oh i know who it is so it's these these nameless women whose faces have become so um ingrained in in western culture it's like canon canonized western culture western culture but we don't know anything about them so right. It's she's, you know, probably the easiest to to talk about because she did have a very rich creative life and was an artist and was a poet and um, was in her time so, so, so famous. But now she's just this sort of after effect, right? She's just the image that has been um, constructed and created by a man who's more famous than she is over and over and over again. So she's one. And then I re I'm from Rhode Island and I'm working on another project, um, a film project um, that I, I don't, I probably can't say too much about it, but one of the elements, there is sort of a vampire subplot in it. And I learned this, there was a graveyard, maybe, I don't know, two miles away from where I grew up um, where there had been an exhumation at the end of the 19th century because they thought that she was a vampire. So it's like this very, you know, when you're a teenager, you go to Mercy Brown's grave in Exeter because it's so spooky. And in the course of my research, I sort of connected this historical fact to a short story that was written in the 20s by a very famous, you can bleep her name out, that wrote about writing this movie about um, and so I started to really, re she wrote this vampire story. And so I started to really research vampirism in New England. And I discovered at 45 years old that this area that I grew up in was like the epicenter of a huge vampire panic from post-revolutionary war until the industrial revolution. Huge. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm like epidemic vampirism. And there was one of the last, discoveries because you know you can the thing basically what would happen is in these rural communities where they were um very anti-science very especially in new england and particularly in rhode island where there's a lot of iconoclasm um and sort of independent living they were anti-medicine anti-science they didn't you know they they were anti-industrialization and they lived these very sort of um old-fashioned lives by the turn of the century and so in these communities, 
tuberculosis would spread really rapidly and they didn't know what it was. And so they came to believe that that consumption, um, which was what it was called then, was was an illness of the soul. And the the epidemics or these the sort of um, rashes of of vampire panic that would happen in these small rural New England towns would often relate to like a teenage, a dead teenage girl. And so there's this sort of eroticism that gets embedded in the story. And the way that they would try to halt the spread of this disease of the soul is that you would exhume the body, often cut the heart out, burn it, and then feed it to the the, the vampire's family members to try to inoculate them. So one of the last discoveries, there are like certain hallmarks um, when you open a, a grave, if you like exhumed one of these graves, there are hallmarks like a stake through the body or they would flip the body over so that they couldn't get up and walk around. Um, and one of the last discoveries of a group of these graves was in, it was very close to New Haven in Connecticut. So we're going to go learn about New England vampirism, which I think is like the perfect example of the afterlife of an image, right? It's like wow. the ghost, the animated ghost. Oh my God, that's so awesome and interesting. And, and actually really crazy because, well, I don't know if I should mention this, but I'm just going to do it because I'm like, oh my God. Do it. Um, so I, as you know, we're going to be writing a song about that's inspired by this interview and you. Um, and um, yeah. I had already kind of gotten a little jump start on the writing process of it because I was like, what if I can't come up with anything cool? So I like wanted to kind of start it and just see where I went with that. And well, there was this song that I had been working on like a while back that I didn't really, I couldn't figure out what the lyrics should be for it. And I knew that oh, at, at first we wrote the music for it. And I mean, we haven't finished it. So, um, but we thought it was going to be about vampires. Like we were going to just make an album <laughs> all about vampires. This is the psychic so clash. We just had a that song that this one that we had kind of gotten into but not finished and i had started some lyrics on um i like wasn't wild i should write about a vampire because i'm like do i really it's not like fully connecting with me i mean i'm really into vampires but i also like it's not like a life experience that i've had you know what i mean and so i it's but that song was like I, I kept hearing that song in my head while thinking about you wow. and you know this interview and I'm like this has to be the song so, for this is how it goes this is how it happened it's funny because I have I'm I'm working on another podcast we're waiting to hear if it's gonna sell but it's about it's like vampire again um very unconnected to the story but there was a woman who was a stripper in in New Jersey, and she was also a writer for the Village Voice. Really interesting woman. Um, and I will keep it very brief because it's a complicated story. But she disappeared, and one of the last pieces that she'd been working on for the Voice it was, I think, she disappeared in 1996. And one of the last pieces she wrote for the Voice was about this vampire underground in New York, which is like an erased sort of outlandish subculture that doesn't exist anymore. But it was like, she was kind of trying to infiltrate these clubs where people would claim to drink blood and people would, it's like, it's, it's really, it's, this is it. We did it. Wow. Mission. Yeah. If you need a theme, a theme to June for the movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's ignition. Well, I mean, the weird thing was like, I, I kind of, I did start getting a little bit more, uh, making a little bit more of a dent in like the lyrical stuff, at least for a few of the verses or, you know, part of the verses in the chorus. And, and I made it like a little more personal and not, not directly like vampire oriented. Although there are some lyrics that I had ideas for with the vampire theme in mind. So that crazy. I or and I just so like, crazy. I don't know, it's just so weird that that. And that did in that way. You have to, when we get off this call, go read about Mercy Brown. Yeah. And the, well, the other thing I wanted to ask you is like, after the research you've done now on like New England, New England vampirism, what do you think about vampires? Like, do you think that there were really vampires or what? I don't, but I think again, it's like another 
another case of culture needing um, a mm -hmm. placeholder or container for anxiety, which is, mm -hmm. I think, you know, this circles back to to the beginning of the conversation that we always need a receptacle to put the the things that we don't want to feel in. If it's fear, right. if it's grief, if it's rage, there's always a, a a person or a group of people that serve the purpose of holding that. And I think, you know, the vampirism is interesting because it all it's it always cycles back. You know, like it's always, um, it always sort of surfaces in culture. It never totally goes away. Like I think some other of those types of fantasies, um eventually just sort of fall off the map but there's it's like a be interesting to look at sort of a time graph for when when our fantasies about vampires kind of peak i'm sure that it's related to something political mm -hmm. Or... Mm -hmm. yeah yeah totally cool well that's i mean okay i had one last one but it's not you basically already answered it but i may as well just put it out there I love how you guys always make a wish for all of your subjects at the end of each episode of the C word um, after, you know, a deep like analysis of, you know, their sort of life stories. And um, so I guess what I wanted to ask you is what would you wish for yourself? But is that's a really dumb question or if you feel like you've already answered it, don't worry about it. I don't have a dumb question. I think, you know, it's it's interesting to think about because I don't it's I think that um I displace things into other people also, like going back to this idea of like putting your feelings or projecting your feelings onto another figure. But, you know, I think what a fantasy if I could just fucking write about vampires all day and write my little movie and finish my book and, you know, find a, a way um, to not have to do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. We can yeah. move to the south of Italy or the countryside. Or... Oh, that's yeah. no, I would be out of here in one second if I could. I would love yeah. to leave New York. I'd love to go live in the woods in Maine or Rhode Island. Love it. Fantasy land. 100%. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for the that's conversation. Nice. What a pleasure. Yeah. 10 well, out of 10. Yeah. Well done, Laura. Aren't you psyched okay. that we're connected the what aren't you psyched that we're psychically connected yeah oh hell yeah <laughs> oh my god like that is yeah this is so cool i mean i don't know i just i'm gonna be thinking about this whole conversation for a long long time to come believe me i can't and wait i really hope that our pads cross again i'm sure that at least we'll talk one more time after the song is done <laughs> i can't wait and I hope I can, yeah, do justice to, yeah, just like my feeling on the matter. I know There's always that like a met that sort of impose like that impending sense of like responsibility, like you're saying. I know. Being, wanting to be able to do justice to the this I know. thing that you feel inside and worrying that you won't be able to. But then when you're able to and you feel a sense of like having accomplished that feeling, okay. it's the best thing ever. <laughs> I agree. All right. Well, anyway, we'll let you go now, but thank you so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. <Whoa. laughs> oh, it's great. Oh, you did an amazing job. Really good. Your enthusiasm really carried thank it. Thank you. I was yeah. really and truly enthusiastic about that. I mean, thank you so much for like just reaching out to her and getting her on board and making that happen because like i would listen to the podcast and be like i wish i could talk to them yeah well, you know and then it occurred to me like well because i think originally i think i had told you that i wanted to interview lena dunham at one point maybe i was in touch. Uh, i had a call with anton first a long time oh, ago okay yeah, and then we were in touch by email right but then i think that when you first reached out to us about doing the podcast like the maybe one of the first people i thought of was maybe joanne newsom probably who was like definitely out of our league. And then I think I might have brought up Lena Dunham, the co-host of the C Word, who works with Alyssa. And she's like pretty high profile. And so that, you know, that didn't pan out. But then, so, and then when I thought, well, why not Alyssa Bennett, who's like not quite as well known? Mm. But I also thought she wasn't going to say yes, to be honest. No, but it's, it's you really connected and such, such a deep interest in her work and, and these themes that you brought out. I mean, I, 
I was just writing down some lyric ideas and uh, awesome. You know, if we don't go vampires. Uh, oh yeah, no, and it's not necessarily like going to be o- overtly vampire related. Mm. It's just sort of themes that I think about in relation to vampires that I had ideas for lyrically. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, I thought like drowned women. I thought it was that that image of her with that image with her, all those drowned women behind her, but it's positive. Was a mm-hmm. crazy like imagine the artwork for that like yeah oh my crazy. god yeah totally because she's really doing and a Ophelia you know, Ophelia is a drowned yeah. woman of course yeah yeah there's another six maybe we have to tie in yeah so one of the things that I had done to kind of brainstorm lyrics for this song I mean I started doing I'm not mm-hmm. yeah you know I'm not like totally set on every on anything yet but um was just to like write a list of words, like what you kind of did, of just words that I feel like come up as inspired by the conversation or by like her mm-hmm. as a person mm-hmm. or the things that she's done. So I have a whole list of just words that I feel like are themes that run through her work mm-hmm. and, you know, her as a person. And, um, but drowned women, that's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Cause I like to interview people who are in service to others and, um, some of the guests are not, and I didn't think I didn't know if she was too much. But now she's—I realize she's in service to the a lot into society and the and the dead as well. The like she's really like a historian or um, what did she? Oh, call she it? is. Yeah, she considers herself a historian of bad behavior. Actually, that's one of the like one of her yeah. descriptive lines that she uses for herself. I can believe that she has the spirits come in the room, you know, because they she's rewriting their their history and i think she must get insights psychically once she's um you know concentrating on someone for a hundred hours that's a lot of mental energy to send to that person and i'm sure that they they get that and they come and see her yeah because she's yeah. gonna correct their story in front of rewrite yeah and she's influencing people like us and i mean other people out there who are going to be making work based on the the material that she's putting out there you know what i mean sure for sure yeah so it's going to echo throughout so many people's voices and yeah, work yeah. no that's really wonderful but can we talk about you for a minute i mean just sure. you know cuz you were late coming and yeah. so you didn't did, didn't get a chance to go i didn't want to I wanted to gush over you for a moment because um i've been really you know going deep down on Foxtel's Brigade. And it's uh, also Anton and Laura, that's your, your side project, mm-hmm. is beautiful as well. I mean, thank you. you have such a fantastic voice and you're really just such, such a, like, you know, your history was, you know, your childhood, for example, which is very eloquently written in your biography about how you you grew up in, in Hol- it was in LA, Hollywood, California. Yep. Yeah, in the Hollywood and, uh, house. And you're such, you know, a product of that, and your artistic upbringing has cre- is creating this wonderful music. You know, it's uh, I'm just well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so I just much. really w- I wanted to collaborate with you as well. I know you, you and Anton make all your music, and it's so, um, you know, what the words you use to describe it. And I mean, the production is wonderful as well. And but if we could contribute in any way, I would just be really over the moon. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, let's we're we're gonna collaborate, obviously. Um, and like the one the song that I had mentioned on the podcast just now, uh, I'm not sure if we should use that or not in terms of like for this or not. You know what I mean? Like that could just be another thing, and we could do our own thing, or or we could I can show it to you, and you can see if you feel inspired by what we've come up with so far. Yeah. Um, well, maybe she'd do that as well because if she does a movie on it, or if she does another podcast when you're when you're making a show you're always just looking for the theme to your music or music to you right so i think you should seize that seize the day on that one yeah so then maybe we could so yeah well just let's just brainstorm like i think that when it comes to the writing thing we'll just brainstorm and we're gonna collaborate on either that or another song and i think okay. it'll be it'll be cool Brilliant. <laughs> thanks so much yeah um yeah anything else at the no, moment, well, I mean, no, I mean, just I wanted to get everyone who's listening to check out your music. At, um, it's on Spotify, Anton, Laura, and Anton. Uh, Laura and Anton is the jazz project, yeah. And then Fox Tales Brigade is the mm. in the or like art 
pop original stuff. But you, you do so much, and you speak perfect French. Is that what you were just no, singing? No, no, I wouldn't. May I speak perfect French <laughs> at all? Because no, that I song is just uh, beautiful. The one that went viral, that? La Vie en Rose. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely not perfect French. It's pretty far from it. In fact, I know that a lot of French people probably don't like it because of how poor my French is. Oh, or really? Oh, my French me. pronunciation is in that recording, but. There's also French people who are like, oh, it's cute. <laughs> How she's like not saying the words right. Or like, you know, they can, there are people who still enjoy it despite my poor pronunciation in that, in that version mm -hmm. uh, or that performance of the song. But since then, I've gotten better mm -hmm. um, and, you know, had lived in Paris for a little while. But yeah, I do feel really self conscious about that with that recording, even though it kind of like went viral or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, there's, I definitely think how I wish I could redo it, you know what I mean? And and have that be the thing that goes viral. But when you have something like that, that kind of is generating a lot of plays or whatever, you don't want to like mess it up. So you don't want to like take it down. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And like try yeah. to, who knows what the circumstances will be next time you release something, you know what I mean? There's like so much that goes into the reason why something becomes viral. It's not just like, oh, this is really good and therefore it's viral. It's like, well, you should just... let, it's the afterlife of videos. Right. Yeah. But um, because I live in the south of Italy and I know lots of people who sing in English, you know, Italians, and this is terrible. But they yeah. think, you know, they've done it a lot and they think they're perfect. And all their friends think they speak perfect, but it sounds almost, I can't really understand what they're saying. Um, so I guess that's the kind of the same thing now you say that. Yeah. So that's me basically doing Lovey and Rose. <laughs> in that recording but now i'm much i will say i'm a lot better now okay but <laughs> you should add that in the description on the comments <laughs> yeah i should just be like i realize this is bad french but whatever i'm letting it happen <laughs> mm. but um, you're, so you're a guitar teacher as well yeah classical guitar yeah, yeah i teach guitar and voice because do you, when you write your songs i was wondering because the ones I really like, you you seem to follow the melody. You get the melody on the guitar first and then write the lyrics. Sometimes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, like one of the first, well, okay, not, okay. Actually, the first Foxtails Brigade song I ever wrote is the song called Foxtails Brigade or was a song called Foxtails Brigade. Mm. And that one um, had a little bit of a different approach. But the next song I wrote called Creeping Ophelia was mm, my approach lady. on that one was I just had the melody like that I figured out on guitar and then I matched each melodic note with a harmonic note like a harmony note sorry not harmonic note and um and that was kind of like how I navigated writing that song crazy and, because that's how you get such interesting melodies well I had the melody first you know and uh. so I kind of like would approach melodies with this in mind so I remember taking a music 30 class like I'd minored in music in college mm -hmm. and one of the first theory classes that I took, I remember our teacher giving us a description of what constitutes a good melody and how he used the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow as an example. Okay. And a good melody, as described by my teacher, is one that takes a journey through a scale and it starts at the beginning and then like it takes off like an airplane and rises up through like the peak of the scale and basically eventually reaches like the height of the scale or the octave and then makes its journey back home. And if you look at somewhere over the rainbow and actually starts with an octave, somewhere octave over the rainbow. And then it slowly kind of weaves its way back through the scale and arrives back at obviously the tonic, like most songs do. Um, and I kept thinking about that. I mean, that always stuck with me, even though it's like a pretty obvious simple concept when I started writing my own music I would think about that and like mm -hmm. how you know you really have just a certain amount of notes to work with in a scale and if you just think of it like that then you've got like a pretty simple outline of what you're working with and then you know obviously writing a melody can be pretty easy once you know what you what your tools are and then if you just approach it by just like melody matching each melody note with a harmony note then you're pretty much it's kind of simple you know like there's not you, yeah it's you could do that I mean I certainly don't do that with all my songs but 
mm-hmm. when I was doing that with that song, I felt like it made it really easy. Like I didn't have to think about multiple harmony notes and chord structures and voice leading. Well, I wasn't thinking about that stuff with that song mm-hmm. and it ended up being what it was. But as time goes on, you know, we do think about voice leading. We do think about obviously chord options and like what's going to be a better chord for this particular mm-hmm. part or whatever and color and you know it's not as it's not like all music is just matching one note with another note you know what i mean yeah. but it's of song, yeah but a lot of a lot of songwriters they they don't want to learn too much theory i know if you heard heard this from other people because of the things that might interfere with their channeling or something and yeah you heard that from other people but you you, you really have an example of how it is a good thing no, I I definitely had that mindset, I think, before. No, not that I didn't want to learn. I just simply didn't know. Like, I, when I first started writing, I think that I was very limited in my understanding of music theory. Mm-hmm. And it did result in some really um kind of, you know, experimental ways of songwriting. Um, mm-hmm. For example, the, like, matching each melody note with one harmony note and just doing two voice harmonies, like, for each melody note. Um, but, you know, and... I think I did have that fear after realizing like I could write without an extensive understanding of music theory. I was like, oh, maybe if I were better, you know, sort of more endowed with an extensive understanding of theory, maybe I wouldn't be as creative. You know, maybe I wouldn't be or outside the box. I would be creative, but maybe I wouldn't be as experimental and like unique Mm -hmm. as the way I am now. And I have met other artists who think that, but I really do think that it's folly to think that way because... Mm -hmm. I just think that when you have knowledge, you know, it just gives you that much more material to work with and, and like you don't have to use it. And it's definitely important to know the rules in terms of communication. And music is about communicating, especially if you want to like play with other musicians, which is such a joy to do. Yeah. You can't not know. Like there's just certain things that you just it makes it so much easier if you know how to communicate using a common language. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I just remember like in my early years of like trying to play with other people being so hindered by my lack of knowledge. And it was like actually embarrassing. Obviously, it can be yeah. embarrassing if you don't know certain things and just made it so much harder to kind of express what I was going for in a piece of music or what I wanted the other musician to do. Mm-hmm. And now I feel like I'm so much better equipped to just communicate and express ideas and like have there be a dialogue you know rather than it just be like can't you just come up with something that makes my thing sound good (laughs) that would almost be the approach and it was just so unfair to the other you know musician or musicians i was working with and Mm -hmm. and so i think that skills and tools you know yeah yeah and it's like you don't have i mean i guess to some degree there is a little bit of um experimentalism that kind of starts to get um hindered with the broader understanding of how pop music is structured and just like traditionally how music is worked through in the Mm. traditional sense and in a classical sense like yes it's like it's like a child in a way when you think about like a baby who's just completely unobstructed by like societal influence and there's this kind of purity there, right? Mm. And the more that the child starts well, to reincarnated. up, you start to like not have that imagination as vividly free flowing mm. and you have limitations, right? No. But that's imperative for getting on in the world. You know, you have to have limitations and boundaries in order to grow and to like function in the world. Mm. So I think okay. that it's just like that with music too. Also, I think for terms of longevity, in terms of style, like for me, I'm kind of on the OK plateau now. I'm kind of repeating my melodies and, you know, you know, like many musicians, you're just comfortable with your thing. But when you have more, you know, collaboration is a great way to do it, but also studying. And um, I had one of my guests, Dave McKean, who is a is a very good uh, artist, graphic designer. He teaches in the university as well. And he said that he some of the students that come in there are really you know, I'm going to do it my way. I've got my style. Okay. I'm not going to learn any of this, you know, I'm not going to learn these other techniques. I've got my style. I'm an, I'm an artist. And some of them, they do have, they have, a, they get out and they peak, you know, and they make a big impact. But after a couple of years, they've got no development because they haven't got these skills to, to come up with another style or 
to develop you know because they haven't got this like you say a language or the mm. skills or the tools so right yeah yeah totally totally i mean obviously people can do whatever they want but yeah. i i do i do think for me it's important to like try to know as much as i can can mm -hmm. absorb um informationally well it comes back to what i was saying about you before is that you're this you're the product of your the years you've had so far no your artistic training that really comes across in in everything you're doing and that's really um re you know is a good advertisement good publicity for people improving themselves and opening themselves to inspiration and you know obviously you had a head start because you're in a crazy place and you had a crazy childhood but uh <laughs> did you ever think you could have been a, you know if you'd have been famous you could have been a subject of one of uh Alyssa Bennett's I episodes imagine that, ever... that I was like I was trying to think about how the people that they they cover are like relatively obscure now but at some point did have a certain amount of fame and recognition and I feel like it kind of takes that for them to cover them in a way because I think about myself and I'm like I I only hope that I can at least achieve the level of recognition that would deem me worthy to be a subject on the C word. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like I don't think that I have even reached that point yet where they would even, you know, cover me who like is pretty much like uh, so insignificant that like there wouldn't really be any Well, you're so, you're not really mad. What did you say? Mad and bad uh Oh, mad really... bad or just plain sad. No, wait, mad sad yeah. or just bad? I don't know. You you know, seem very balanced to me, so I don't think you'd make the cut for the C word, even if you, even if you made Maybe, it. Maybe I don't know. But the weird thing is, like they're doing this, that, or they were doing this thing on the last season where they were trying to promote a fundraiser that they were doing to uh, raise funds for abortion right and access and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. one of the incentives they were offering for people to contribute was that they would get entered into a drawing to have a C word episode done all about that person. Wow. So like some C word listener would get to have a C word episode done on them. And I was thinking like, what if it was just somebody who like, <laughs> I mean, like, how are they going to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a certain yeah. format to their show where they, you know, they're covering certain type of person. notorious like and famous people who had like a specific level of, of ad, you know, public admiration and popularity and then had a fall from grace. Like the fall from grace yeah. is almost like imperative to the formula yeah. of the show. <laughs> It seems so to like, be two important parts there. <laughs> yeah, like what if there's being not up and they're being down? Right, right. And so I'm curious to know like how they're gonna approach that whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> it'd have to be like uh, the, the the fame TV. What's the stars in your eyes? Well, the one where they sing on the what's the name of that one in America? It's uh, the Voice in yeah. here. And... Oh, you mean uh, American Idol? American Idol, yeah. So you have to go American Idol, but it's, they get you up there, and then they also break crash you right down. As part of the format. Like they're gonna they're gonna somehow extract a fall from grace from your yeah. story, whether you even were aware of it or not. Yeah, no, they bring you up and then they they smash you down again. Probably have good viewing figures because people like to watch car crashes. But uh... well, I'm sure that they could find some way to paint my picture in a way that would not be, you know, the most yeah. flattering. Like there's obviously, I mean, yeah, I could look at my career and just go, oh, you know. This person pretty much like had nothing <laughs> in terms of success. So, and yeah, they're doing this other, I don't know. There's all kinds of ways they could go about it. But the fact is like, I just don't think that they would, you know, no, because no, it's no. just not influential enough. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully that will change though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm super inspired here. I'm going to just let it digest as well. And uh, I'll send you some of our ideas that I have and uh, I'll send you a recording of the episode. And, some and so how do you want to go how are like what is the process for going about collaborating on the writing of the song like i know you kind of listed it in the email but just to recap i'll sort of like write a little idea out or like and uh, come up with sort of just a skeleton of some kind and then pass it to you and then you contribute to it or do we do it where we're like sitting on the phone talking about it no i haven't done that too many times usually it's best okay. when the, the muse is in the room you know you're on your own in a diet, little closet um playing okay. quietly and so that's kind of the way i do it i'll send you some ideas as well and then um okay we have a production team here in italy who would love to work with you so we have some great musicians piano double bass uh, um guitar and all these sounds effects as well and we can we'd love to to get involved in that aspect as well so, okay yeah 
All like right, to tread cool. on Anton's toes. Because... No, he's just like, bear. he has, okay, for that song that I talked about, the vampire one, which I kind of changed and already started on lyrically. Um, he just feels very strongly about the chord progression and like the melody, basically. Like he doesn't want to, I mean, just certain parts of the melody, he's pretty much like fixed on. And okay. even I am not allowed to change them. Like he's, <laughs> I have wanted to do certain things differently on the chorus. And he's like, no, don't. he's like, you cannot repeat this melody here. And he wow. goes, this. so he's just like, you have to do it this way or you're not going to be able to use this song. And I'm like, but we started the song together. But he's Gosh. just like, really, God, you know. He seems like such a calm guy, you know, and such a. He gets really, person. he gets really, um, I guess, stubborn about, you know, mm, he, I mean, here's him. the thing. I also trust him too. Like, mm. I know that for 90% of the time, he's right about something. And I actually, this is something that we both feel about music that is probably very controversial for other musicians. Mm. We do believe that there is like a right way and a wrong way to do a certain thing in music. Mm. Like, right. we think that there's really true good and true bad okay. in music. And maybe you don't agree with that. I'm sure a lot of people don't agree with it. An absolute yeah. It's something we've discussed and like analyzed quite a bit and come to the conclusion that where there is something that is like inherently good and that is going to sound good in music and there's stuff that's inherently not good in in music and that when it's not good, that's basically like the wrong thing to do. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I bow to your judgment. I'm a very flexible. So we want, want to, we want to foxtail. I love you, the sound. So I'm not going to argue with the altar. I hate to say it like that. I know it sounds so just like dog. I don't know. It just sounds so. You're so, doing it right. I mean, look at the catalog. Look at this. Look at the look at what you've we're made. Not, so. We must not be doing it totally right because we're obviously not very famous or like it's not catching on the way that, you know, we would have hoped. But somehow we just we do have these beliefs and like and but we don't always agree on what what the right thing is sometimes. Even retrospectively. Well, yeah, like there is one song that we wrote, um, Castles in the Air, that I most, I, I would say I wrote most of it. Anton did a great arrangement on it. Um, but there was one part in the melody um, and chord progression, like at the end of the second verse, where it goes into the chorus. Well, actually, it's like at the end of the verse where it goes into the chorus. And I really wanted to resolve the melody to a one. And he wanted it to stay on the five before going in the melt. He thinks that if I were to resolve it, it would be like too disjunct, disjointed. Mm -hmm. And it would be like making the listener think the song was over when it wasn't over. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no. And and he, I let him win that one. Okay. And every time I listen to it now, I'm like, I wish I had just done what I wanted to do right there. Because I don't feel that that was the right choice, even in retrospect. And I still now, like when I play it in person, I'm still like doing it my way that I want to do. And like, I mean, I'll do it my way that I want to do sometimes. And I think, yeah, this clearly sounds better, mm. you know? And um, and like, it happens a lot in old jazz songs that I listen to that like, it's not an unheard of type, you know, thing to do in music. But he still anyway. doesn't admit he's wrong. No, he doesn't. Well, I could never be in a band with my partner. So you're... You know, you've got it. It's weird, though. Yeah, we have a weird relationship musically because I feel like I learned so much from him, you know, mm. like that I'm almost like indebted to him. Yeah, well, I'm a Foxtails fan, so I, I can't I can't choose between you. You're just going to have to get out, work it out yourself. But anyway, but yeah, the point is like it's not it's just there's like just certain small things in that song that you feel strongly about. But other than that, like there is room for collaboration. So, OK, brilliant. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Okay, good. sorry, I don't want to scare you. Yeah, I don't. I hope you're not like, oh god. No, no, no. I, artists, I'm used to. I'm. This podcast is built on you know flexibility and collaboration. So I'm. It's your show, your episode. So. Thank you so much again for having us, and yeah, for choosing us to do the show with you. My pleasure. You've been. You lived up to the billing. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll be in touch soon then. All right. Take care, Laura. Re okay, regards to Anton. Day. Okay, thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the song and the episode. The song will be released next week. It will be available on all streaming platforms, but you can already pre-save. Please support the artists by following them on social media and adding the song to any playlists you have. This is a completely free show, and you've listened this far, so I'd really appreciate it if you could pay us back by clicking like and subscribe. And follow at PodSongs on social media platforms or subscribe to the newsletter at podsongs.com for special updates. Or just tell the next person you see about this amazing show where musicians interview their idols and write a song about them. The songs are available for download from the Podsongs website as well, which pays a lot more than the 0.00 whatever we get from Spotify. You can also email me at jack at podsongs.com to give feedback, suggest an artist and guest combos you'd like to hear, or just say hello. We're a listener-supported show, and I'd love to hear from you. A final thanks to my researchers, Dory Verbo and Rosa Marino, my producer, Maurizio Sanicola of Goldmine Records, and musicians, Massimino Vozza and Luigi Falcioni.
The next episode will be out soon. In the meantime, you can listen to more amazing episodes in the archives. Until then, have a great day.